500 years ago, England was emerging into a new era. After years of war, plague and famine, the kingdom was enjoying peace and prosperity under the reign of the first Tudor king, Henry VII. A new class of business-savvy farmer was thriving, boosting food production. And then over she goes. While wool from their sheep was generating half the nation's wealth. Many of the nation's farms were under the control of the biggest landowner in England after the king, the monasteries. Their influence could be felt in every aspect of daily life. They were not just places of religion, they were at the forefront of technology, education and farming. But with the daily lives of monks devoted to prayer, they depended increasingly on tenant farmers who worked and tended their lands. Steady, girls. <laughs> now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to Tudor England, here at Wealdon Downland in West Sussex, to work as ordinary farmers under the watchful eye of a monastic landlord. Here we That's the way. Nice. To succeed, they'll have to master long-lost farming methods. Watch those flanks again and again. And get to grips with Tudor technology. <laughs> Quite no easy. It's a really violent process. While immersing themselves in the beliefs... Amen. Oh, customs and rituals that shaped the age. This is merry England, for heaven's sake, so to speak. Let's enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the untold story of the monastic farms of Tudor England. It's July. Ruth, Peter and Tom are more than halfway through their time on the farm. The pea crop has flowered and very soon it should be producing a harvest. I yeah. am flabbergasted with just how many peas are on each plant. It's staggering, isn't it? The barley cereal crop is also thriving. As are the sheep and the pigs. Are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> But farming was not the only way monastic land was exploited to make money. The monasteries encouraged other enterprises and would send representatives to meet with tenants who wanted to expand into new areas. Professor James Clark, an expert in medieval history, has come to meet Tom and Peter to explain the abundant opportunities on the land. Of course, it's important to remember that the monastery's economic interests are not just confined to farming. The monastery owns a huge diversity of, of landscape, and it's especially interested in the natural resources uh, that that landscape contains. Um, and perhaps the preeminent interest in this period in, in that regard is, is lead, lead mining. Would farms like us be involved in these commercial processes then? We know that just prior to the dissolution, a number of tenants are beginning to branch off into, into those areas. They can't rely for a secure income on the produce of, of, of farming alone. The church imposed itself on the landscape of medieval England. Great abbeys and cathedrals were built to stamp the church's authority across the country. Vital to their construction was lead. Its malleability and resistance to corrosion made it perfect for roofing, guttering and windows. This created huge demand for the material. Following in the footsteps of Tudor farmers, the boys are heading off to mine their own lead. Areas around the Pennines, Derbyshire and Shropshire were the biggest centres of lead mining in the Tudor period. The mines are now long abandoned and overgrown. Tom and Peter are meeting with experts Colin Richards and Nick Southwick to reopen one. Right, Peter, here's your lead mine. Oh, brilliant, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a bit more like a, uh, a rabbit warren or something. Yes, we've got to do a, a little bit of digging to actually get into the mine, but uh, 
The mines in this area haven't been operated for 130 years. Would farmers be doing this sort of thing? Oh, yes, because in any age, if you could sort of gain extra money, you could improve your life. You could get a better horse, better clothes, better wine. So it could make all the difference between a subsistence existence and one where you could have a few luxuries. I suppose it was a, a metal very much in demand, especially with um, the monasteries and what they were using it for. You could sell all you could extract. So, you know, you could turn your labour into money very easily. Farmers who turned their hand to mining in the summer months could earn up to four pounds in extra income, the equivalent of buying 80 extra sheep for the farm. I think it's getting big. Shovel this out, Pete. Yeah. Then I think we can get a body in. Shall I do that? I'm a bit svelter than you are, Peter. You are, you are a little homunculus, Tom. We'll <laughs> get you down there. Here he goes. Push. <laughs> He's going. Oh, that opens up quite quite a lot, actually. Yeah, it should do. Is there room for another one? I reckon. Just follow on. Oh, dear. It widens out a bit, so yeah. we could probably fit that wheelbarrow in, if you like. <laughs> Thank you. All right, here we go. You lads OK? As one of the kingdom's largest landowners, Monasteries owned vast waterways that were full of another valuable resource, fish. The church encouraged people to fast from meat three days a week, creating a high demand for fish. Ruth setting out to catch one of the most popular fish of the day, eels. The first job is to make an eel trap, with help from basket maker Simon Cooper. Whoops, I nearly lost that. <laughs> Lovely and soaked and bendy. Well soaked, soaked and earth. <laughs> yeah, nice and bendy. Look at that. They're using willow, a tree commonly found beside streams. So we're using the twinning technique, which means we're using two at once, yeah? That's it. Woven one over the other. Around we the... twist them each time. They go around. Go around. Stave, yes. Just get it tight, otherwise we'll lose anything we might be catching. The traps are made from two woven cones, one slotted inside the other. Yes. Oh, yeah, you can see it the, in that this, one, can't this you? Is, this is a very open design one, and you can see the eel, eel will go in through the front here. Right, so the eel swims in, gets through that gap nice and easily, but because it's all spiky, you can't turn around and go you back through it. You can't turn around and go out, no. This method of laying traps for fish is a technique that goes back thousands of years and is even mentioned in the Magna Carta. And, of course, one thing with the, the eel as well is very easy to keep alive out of water, yeah. as long as it's damp. Yeah, uh, so you cool. can transport them in damp sacking. S sacking or straw, yes, yes. You didn't really need refrigeration because um, they, they, they almost breathe, can almost breathe through their, their skin. This, then, is going to be dropped into here. Yeah. And then we need to try and weave the whole weave, lot together. Weave the, the whole lot together. Yeah, so what you mean about nice. needing to be really firm? Yes, right? we hope our basket work isn't too open so the eel will find a way out because they're very, very good at finding little holes. <laughs> <laughs> With the mine reopened, the team are navigating the passages that should take them to the lead ore. Monasteries granted leases to those who wanted to mine for lead on their land. Uh, come to a mine, you said, Tom. <laughs> It'll be fun. So, Colin, how far are we going in at the moment? Well, we need to go in about sort of 300, 400 yards. <laughs> Whoa! That is fantastic. This is a lot bigger than I thought it would be. So when it was in sort of full production, there would have been men on platforms all over this space. This is the first time the mine has been worked for over a century. So what are we, what are we actually looking for, Colin? 
you're looking for those silver specks in the rock, which are the sort of galena, the lead, to see where you've got a concentration, where you've got the richest ore deposits, and then work from there. Miners worked in pairs and removed the lead ore by hand using hammers and chisels. The skill is hitting the chisel without hitting the holder. Oh. <laughs> Remember, it's not a race. I'll weigh down. The veins of lead ore were often set at 45 degree angles in the rock, making for tough working conditions. I feel like we're going quite far in. Is this? Yeah, I true? think you've broken off a, a decent piece there. The weight of the rock was the key indication of lead ore being present. What are we thinking, Tom? How does it feel weight wise? No. Have a feel. It's like a feather. I don't think we'd have made very good miners. <laughs> <laughs> we're just getting our eye in. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's actually a lot heavier. Feel that. You can feel the extra weight, can't you, compared to the other bit? What's yeah. that look like? Oh, yes, that's, that's what we're looking for. Are we finished, then? Is that, is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're looking at about 50 barrel loads a day, <laughs> we've got one lump in the bottom <laughs> at the moment. Better pick up the pace. Let's give that a go. Oh, now, that's what I'm talking about, Tom. <laughs> Look at that. That is a piece of lead ore. Soft. Whole families often worked in the mines. Every day, they faced dangers from flooding and long-term inhalation of poisonous lead dust. Every little bit counted. So, you know, the, the small children would be down here, sort of as bits were flying off, putting them in the barrows and uh, taking them to the surface. There was, um, you know, nothing wasted. Lift with your legs. Straight back. <laughs> was that the creak in the barrow or you? <laughs> it's amazing how much they must have had to have shifted, Colin. This is hard, hard work. That's why I'm doing it, not Tom. To exploit their natural resources above ground, monasteries leased out the fishing rights on rivers. Their traps complete, the next job is for Ruth and Simon to set them in the water. It, it's, it's, it's best to set these, these traps in the e evening because the eels, through the heat of the day, they tend just to, to lurk it in the shadows and in, in the cool because they don't like getting too, too hot, really. So, right. so that just drops in. On that, the should, that should drop in, and we need to just tie, tie, a, tie a mark to a reed somewhere. Eels are drawn to dark places, so the traps must be left in the shade. I wondered if we perhaps headed off over there to under that shady tree. Cause it looks sort of, you know, a good place which yours might lurk. So we wait this pot so it sits on the bottom, yeah? Yes, so that the eels will, can, can swim straight into it. That's it, parallel to the bank, that's lovely. The ends of the traps are filled with dead fish, an eel's favourite food. Nice, stinky fish. Stinkier the better, so they can smell it. Oh, good old that, that'll attract them. Wet hay. I'll just plug at the top so that the fish can't get out. It's not just to keep the bait in, but it's to stop the eels getting out. I always want to call them pots, but that's not the right name for them, is it? Down here, we tend to, tend to call them puchins, but I know all, all around the country there's, there's grigs, wheels. It's almost an indicator, really, of a truly ancient craft, isn't it, when the tools have all these regional names? Of course, they all had different shapes as well, depending on the maker, really. <laughs> Down oh, you go. Going to sink. Is this branch going to hold it? I think so. The lead ore has been brought to the surface of the mine. Now it must be smelted to extract the metal from the rock. This is done by heating the ore to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. To achieve these temperatures, the Tudor smelter would make use of their natural environment. Mm -hmm. 
Furnaces were placed on windy hilltops to help fan the flames. A superfuel known as white coal was used. It was made by simply drying out wood in a kiln. So it's like any kind of oven, really, like you know, a bread oven or anything? Very much. It's very similar to a bread oven in that you heat the stone up and then it's the heat in the mass of the oven which dries the wood. Heating the wood removes moisture and impurities, allowing it to burn hotter. That's the one we've been looking for. The kiln must be airtight, so gaps are filled with clay. So I'll put a little fire in here, and then if it's completely sealed, the only smoke will be coming out the entrance. Right, if I was you, Tom, I'd get a handful of clay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I need to, but sure. <laughs> I'll indulge you, Tom. OK. <laughs> I think we get a few gaps here, Tom. But I can still rescue this quickly. It's very atmospheric. I might owe you an ale. The best wood to convert into white coal is oak. Whoop. That was almost my fingers. <laughs> Got plenty of wood there, I see. Here we go. Is this going to change much, Colin? No, it won't change appearance much, but any residual moisture will be driven off through the heat in these stones. To help the lead melt more quickly, the ore is smashed into small pieces. Give it a whack. Put your arms into it while you have to smelt it. There we see? Go. There you go, brilliant. So how much of this is going to be lead? 80%. That high? Yeah, That's that brilliant. high. Yeah. So it's a good return on yeah. our effort. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. The wood, having dried for four hours in the kiln, is now right. white coal. Is it, is it hot? I'm not going to lie to you, it looks pretty similar. <laughs> well, it's incredibly dry. The next job is to build a furnace to smelt the lead ore. At the base, Colin is making a hearth where the lead will collect. So we just need to spread it so that it goes up the slope a little bit more. So this clay lining is going to firm up during the firing process and it will actually be our bowl of lead at the end of the smelting. On top of the hearth, a fire is built by stacking layers of timber. And we'll lay these as close together as we can. Right. The furnace is finished with layers of hot burning white coal onto which the lead ore is placed. It's all our Especially broken. crushed ore, yeah. OK. That's pretty heavy. Excellent. Okay. Well done, lads. Gosh, there's some weight in that. Yeah. <laughs> Should we just leave it in the sack? Yeah. Look at that glinting in the sunlight. We fold this over and we put the white coal over the top. And that heat wrapped round our ore is going to be the final sort of almost turbo boost to smelt it and melt it and be the conclusion of this big inferno. Eels were a staple food in monasteries that owned rivers. But for lay people who needed permission to access these rivers, they were a luxury. Simon and Ruth are heading out to check the traps. Do you have to um, change the places you put the traps, or do you just use the same spot? If it hasn't caught anything for a day or so, we, we look for somewhere else, because after a while, you tend to find the places where the eels, eels like to run. No, I can't see anything there. Nothing? I'm pretty certain that's empty. One down, six more to check. Let's hope we have a bit more luck on the next one. Fishermen were expected to give a proportion of what they caught to the monasteries. Anything else they could keep. Just there, I can see the string entering the water there. We're going to be lucky this time, I yeah, think. Yeah, well, that's my hope. Oh, gosh, there are! There eel, are. eel, eel! Yeah! Come on, out you come. Are they keen? <laughs> There's one, there it is, look! Gosh, it's hard to see. There's one, there it is. Yes, there's two. Oh, three! Oh, three. Three. oh my goodness, three! three. Is, he, is he safe in there? I need something to knock him back in with if it does, I can't! I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. 
<laughs> <laughs> it's too snake-like, I can't. I was going to try and be all hard. <laughs> oh, there you go. He was quite sweet when he came out. No, though. there's nothing sweet about it. He liked you. Oh, my toes are all curled now. <sighs> so you're looking forward to catch some more now, are you? <laughs> Two more pots left, haven't we? I think so, yes, yeah. Tudor farmers relied on the landscape to provide them with their tools. Cotton grass and other dry plants, such as moss, were used for tinder on fires. As night falls, the natural tinder is put to the test on the smelting furnace. So this can light our kiln, can it? Well, I, th I would think so. Should we just try it? Yeah. Ooh. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that's done. We'll do the trick. Let's put a good handful in there. Oh, look at that. It's amazing. It's starting to take hold now, Tom. It's going to go from, say, 20 degrees up to 600 degrees. Could we achieve that kind of temperature just wood? Not so quickly. You know, that extra boost with the white coal is going to, you know, be the icing on the cake, really, that final boost to take it from a rock to a molten metal. As the temperature rises, the lead should melt from the rock and trickle down into the hearth at the base. I'll tell you what, this is. This is <laughs> fierce. This is one of the fiercest <laughs> fires I've ever felt. When you're smelting, can you tell from the colour of the flame what's happening oh, to the yeah. ore? Yeah, very much so. As it starts to drop down, you know, various gases come off it. Can you see that blue...? Oh, yeah, just forming up on the right-hand yeah. side, yeah. It's really visible, actually. But after a promising start, things begin to go dangerously wrong. That wind coming up the hill, it's making the fire burn hotter on one side and it's starting to tilt. We're trying to rectify it with a couple of timbers, but we may not end up smelting all our lead. If they don't work fast, all their hard work will be destroyed. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't disturb the top. Fire has been rescued, for now. You know, it, it's collapsing, but more or less within its own footprint, which is what we wanted. It's definitely reducing as yeah, well, isn't yeah. it? As they reduce in size, there's greater opportunity for the lead to actually go through the gaps into our bowl that we created. At the moment, you know, I'm quite happy the way it's going. The fire will continue to burn overnight. Only in the morning will they find out if it has worked. Lead was one of the most important materials in building medieval cathedrals and churches, and integral to making stained glass. Christians saw light as symbolic of God's power and aimed to build churches that would be open to as much light as possible. Ruth's come to Lincoln Cathedral to meet Glazier Richard Still, who's making stained glass. Let's play about with, with this piece. Right. The first thing that they did was score the glass with a flint. So we've got a bit of wood, we've rubbed it with powdered chalk, and the design's drawn out with just some charcoal. So you can just trace through, because glass being so helpfully yep. see-through. It's very crude and hard to control. And then some little sort of moon-shaped cross-hatching, just to encourage the glass to, to, uh, to break where way. we would like it to break. OK. So lots of little nibbly yep. sort of... And actually, when Glazier's workshops have been excavated, they've found fragments of glass with these little cross-hatch marks on. Have they? So, we, you know, we, we, we can be quite, quite sure, sure that... this really is uh, the that, technique yeah, that Yeah, it used. really happened. OK. The next technique is, is even cruder, and it is simply breaking the glass. Um, and it's a case of using this tool. This is, this is a grosing iron. Uh, grosing meaning to crush, 
and, right. and that's really all we're doing is crushing the edge of the glass. So we're sort of nibbling so away at it. Nibbling away. And that way up. That's so right. More Fingers leafage. close. Finger is in close to the edge yeah. that we've marked and just nibble. Glass was expensive in Tudor England because producing it was so slow and labour intensive. I'm doing very tiny nibbles because I'm scared stiff. <laughs> <laughs> You're right to be scared. <laughs> You can't really put it back once you take it away, can you? You can't. It's, it's a once and forever process. It's so unpredictable, um, so hard to control. A lot of glass must have been broken where you didn't want it to be broken. Mm. I can imagine many an apprentice getting a severely clipped ear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for but, breaking an important and, piece. Yeah, and, and it always breaks just right at the last minute when you think everything's almost perfect. That's looking pretty good, isn't it? It was slow, but it is... But it is a slow process. I'm pretty okay. impressed. In the 1500s, England was producing up to 500 tonnes of lead a year. Tom and Peter are returning to see whether the smelting fire has been successful in producing lead. Ah, oh, wow. Oh, steady. <laughs> yes. Well, this is the remains of our kiln. It's just burnt down to ash. I mean, our clay bowl at the bottom, I thought it was going to break up in the heat, but that's actually just gone solid. That's amazing. Look at the that colour. That is metal. Oh, look. Whoa, look. We've got loads of lead there, Tom. Have you got a bag there, have you? I have. I came prepared. <laughs> so at least one of us did. Whoa, look at that. Look at that. Get that down get it in the middle. The lead must now be refined. Colin has made a refining kiln in the woods. This process requires a much more controlled temperature than smelting, so it must be sheltered from draughts. OK, just tip it in. Yeah. Well, these are called... Uh, black working hearths or black working ovens because the lead that you brought has got a bit of ash mixed in and there's a, a sort of dark tinge to it. You know, the, the first burn is taking it from the rock. Here we're getting rid of the impurities. The main impurity that's removed is sulphur, driven off as hazardous fumes. OK, Colin. Moment of truth, eh? <laughs> right. It's like Christmas as I unwrap it here. OK. Here we go. Nice. While the lead is being refined, the team make moulds for ingots using wet sand. So I'll be gentle, yeah? Yeah. Tomo's pumping the bellows and we're taking it in turns to just get this furnace absolutely raging. And the lead, it's coming out the bottom. You can just see it, it's trickling out like a, a silver stream and he's collecting it in a, a, an iron crucible. And he's just about pouring it into the moulds. So you don't want it spilling all over the place because it burns and it sticks as well. So <laughs> not wishing to put any pressure, but you're in the hot seat. Carol, wait in this. In there. Yeah. Okay. Ooh! Yeah. Right. <laughs> Fast and loose with our legs. Put the rest in there. Yeah. The quality appears so much better. It looks cleaner, looks more polished even than it did before it was refined. I know, I, in my mind, lead is not silver. Lead is a, a kind of dull colour, but I suppose that's oxidisation with the air, isn't it? It is. And looking at this, though, it's shiny and it's bright, and it looks like it is worth money. The ingots will weigh just over two pounds and will go towards making a fother, the unit for just over a tonne of lead. It was worth up to eight pounds. Right, I suppose to take our ingots out. Oh, they might actually be cold. Yeah, they're kind of warm. They're so warm, but... We've got that kind of rough sand indentation on the sides. This is one of the characteristics of sand-casted metal. You get that sort of um, indentation of the sand, which gives it a slightly rougher surface, and it's one of the means of identifying, you know, sort of medieval leadwork, really. That has come from that. I oh, know. 
That was hard work. These were tricky, but ultimately a success. I think we need to get this to the monastery. At the cathedral, Ruth's shaped the pieces of stained glass and is returning to complete the panel. Some of the largest and most elaborate windows were commissioned during the medieval period, all held together with lead. A survey at the time estimated that monasteries held some 20,000 fathers of lead. In the 1530s, Henry VIII targeted this valuable material during the dissolution of the monasteries. It was ripped out, melted and sold. So here's the panel that, that, uh, that, 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 that we're working on. Uh -huh. We've got a horseshoe nails um, around. You've cut this piece, this last piece, to go in beautifully, I have to say. So what you're going to do is, is take a piece of lead and this is the scaffolding that holds the window together. Strips of lead made from ingots were then melted and poured over reeds. This is called <gasps> so lead came, uh, C-A-M-E. I know this seems odd, but it's, it's like modelling in marzipan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of got um, that same... When marzipan's cold, it sort of seems to behave in much the there's, same way. There's a, there's a resistance. There's but, a resistance, but, 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 but not give. that much. Yep. So presumably I need but to get an angle on you, that you, corner first. You need first. to take an angle of 45 degrees. Just there. Yep. And then in. It is just so soft. Is that close that enough to the fit? That looks fantastic. Now, what we need to do, let me help here, because I'll put a finger there. Right. Uh, and what you're going Ooh, to do nails, yes. is use a couple of nails. To hold. Just to hold. Yeah. And then we have to solder it? We have to solder it. To fuse the lead together, it is soldered by melting another metal onto the join. Animal fat, known as tallow, is applied to the joints first. Yep, perfect. Gosh, it's not much, is it? It's not much, it's just enough for the tallow to melt and form a layer between the air and the lead. Okie doke. You'll probably so find a little it bit easier. of warming. Yeah. Then touch and let it melt through. Ooh, That's it. That melted through fairly quickly. That's Hold nice. Hold and come straight up. Straight up. up. That's beautiful. Okay, Fantastic. I'm the fire. Oh, that's made quite a nice little round bead, hasn't yes. it? Yes, so what you've got to remember is that this joint is an integral part of the structure of the window. If this comes apart in five years, or ten years, or fifty years, or a hundred years, <laughs> the window Disaster. falls apart. Okay, moment of truth, I suppose. <laughs> Ooh. Is it actually going to hold together? Yeah, and there we go. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> do you like it? Is it a thing of beauty? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Down flat on the board, it looks rather dead and plain. Mm. But as soon as you've got light coming through it, it seems to sort of come to life. It comes alive, doesn't it? It does. It's yeah. completely different. And, and this handmade glass with its ripples and its bubbles and its imperfections are a part of that. Yeah. It's, it's not just a, a slab of transparent stuff. And, and that's the beauty of the material. After three days away at the mine, the boys are returning to the farm. That lead mining's knackered me. <laughs> yeah. I'm a broken man. Well, yeah, you and me both. <laughs> Over we go. Over. Okay. Good girls. On long journeys, travellers would stop to spend the evening at an inn, where their animals could also be housed for the night. Monks saw it as their Christian duty to provide hospitality to travellers. Monasteries with land on major pilgrimage and trade routes also seized this as a business opportunity, building inns which could be leased out for revenue. Ah, welcome to the inn. What's your drinks order? Water? 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 Ale. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to come in with you, aren't I? You are. OK, <laughs> girls, you've done well. We'll be back in a bit. And see how much parking costs. <laughs> Inns were busy places, bringing together the old and the young. 
Sometimes preachers could hope to capture an audience. Priests give themselves to feasting and banqueting, spend themselves in vain babbling. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Inns like this were originally designed to be accommodation blocks. But having built them for that purpose, they quickly became spaces that really lent themselves to public speaking, such as our friar is doing, and, and to entertainments too. And this shape forms a sort of natural auditorium and informs the architecture of theatres for generations to come. And drowned in the delights of this world, patronise those who cater for their pleasure. A wide range of social functions would take place at the inn, from religious to commercial. It was a microcosm of Tudor life. Cheers. Cheers, Ruth. Well, it's good to be in a pub. It's such a familiar sort of thing to be doing, too, isn't it? It's like going to a hotel and a pub all sort of rolled into one. I mean, you, if you could hire a room at a place like this for your private party, you could have your wedding reception here, yeah. you know, or a christening party. Business meetings. Loads of people came to inns for business meetings, which really makes sense, doesn't it? You know? well, I guess they're on the same routes as trade, trade routes, exactly. roads, roads. They're on so all the major roads, constant. and they're in the hearts of, of major towns and market centres where people are coming together anyway. So, of course, you have your business meeting at these yeah. sorts of places. It's a conference centre. Yeah. <laughs> Inns were also places to have fun, and drinking games were popular, such as the Puzzle Cup. Can you drink out of that without spilling it? <laughs> it looks like men's work. <laughs> For a second there, I thought it was amazing. You have a go, you have a go. Oh! oh that doesn't work. No. Is there a hole under there as well? Where do you use? OK, so these puzzle cups. Yeah. Oh, here we go. A little hole. Yeah, I found that bit. You have to cover up with your hands. Yeah, I managed to do that. Thank you. Yeah. And then... Ready? We're ready. Oh! <laughs> Accommodation could vary depending on your budget, from communal rooms to private suites. Oh, this is nice. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm having a little bit. <laughs> one's big and one's little. Most in rooms were crowded places. If you were a single chap travelling, you would expect to share the bed with somebody else um, who might be a complete stranger. Oh, if only I had that luxury. <laughs> 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 They're not exactly down. bouncy, are they, these beds? They're all right, though. So what kind of quality are we dealing with? This, this is pretty good for an inn, this is. How many stars are we looking at here? Four. Four? I can see them through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> No, go on. Move over. Move over. <laughs> Very Morecambe and wise. Make a wish, Tomo. It's your lucky night. <sighs> Peter, get your knee out of my back. Shut up over there! It's late July, a time when farmers need to keep a close eye on their crops as they neared harvest. Tudor farmers would also use this time for haymaking, weeding, and checking the progress of young animals who would provide valuable income later in the year. The woodlands owned by monasteries were a perfect place to rear young pigs. Tenants would seek rights from their monastic landlords to pasture pigs in the forest, known as pannage. The team's six piglets have been foraging in the woods for a couple of weeks. Peter and pig farmer Neil Careswell have come to check on their progress. Pig, pig, pigs! Do you reckon they'll come to our call? Oh, I think so. I think so. Hey, piggies! Here we go. Piggy! Piggies! Pig, pigs! Right there. 
Look how big they've become. They have grown Fantastic. up fast. Fantastic. They? Oh, they've, they've done, done a, well. They've done a good job of clearing this woodland. Not only do the acorns and roots provide rich sustenance for the piglets, but their foraging also clears the undergrowth, allowing young trees in the woodland to thrive. But that's what they would have used them for. They're, they're you know, fantastic excavators. They would have pushed them into sort of land like this, and you've noticed they've not touched any of the coppicing wood. So they'll clear everything else, um, and then you know, the woodman used to be able to come in, and it was ready for them. Pork was in great demand by both the monasteries and the lay community, as pigs were inexpensive to keep and the meat easy to preserve. Keeping pigs was a useful money spinner for the ambitious Tudor farmer. Our Tudor farming Bible. So you got your Bible? A book of husbandry. <laughs> What's it say, then? Well, you tell me. <laughs> I find it hard to read. Right, OK. For it is an old saying mm -hmm. that he hath both sheep, swine, and bees. Sheep, swine, and bees. Got, got, got. He may thrive because he hath these things that most profit of in, in shortest space of time. This is basically saying we'll get the most amount of profit out of these guys yep. for the least amount of investment. By scavenging like this, a piglet could grow quickly, allowing the farmer to slaughter them young. So a Tudor farmer couldn't sustain these pigs through winter on feed, but a Tudor farmer could sustain himself, I suppose, on the, the meat from the pigs. Definitely. They would have looked at trying to get as much slaughtered and as much preserved, dried, smoked uh, and stored, ready for the winter, rather than feed the animal through the winter. Yeah. Definitely. These guys, I mean, are they ready to slaughter yet? Um, you can check. You can have a, a feel of their spine. You go along their spine and just have a feel of the two fillets either side. Yeah. If the spine's very, very protruding, then yeah. you know it's underweight. Uh, and these guys are fine. You know, there's no, no bones sticking out. Yeah. They're, they're, they're good size. They're very, uh, they're very <laughs> boisterous. That's always a good sign. But no, I think we've got a, a while to go yet. Ow! <laughs> Obviously still hungry, though. <laughs> I feel a bit like the witch out of Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> <laughs> How fast are you? I call it going on holiday, so we'll maybe use yeah. that term from now on so they don't hear us. <laughs> hey, chaps. But I think we're really, really on target. They're looking fantastic. <laughs> The farmhouse was not just where the farmer, his family and staff lived. It was also a business centre where deals were made and meetings were held. So Ruth's considering some home improvements. Appearances were important and aspirational farmers would want to emulate the tastes of wealthy Tudors through their decorations. At the top end of society, people really enjoyed bold, strong colour and pattern, and they covered their walls in fabrics, in paintings. The most expensive thing that you could have in your palace, in your castle, in your abbot's lodging, was a tapestry. So, as somebody of more modest means, imitating tapestry was a really <laughs> socially, upwardly mobile sort of thing to do. So many people went to the painters or stainers in order to achieve it. And a stainer is somebody who paints on cloth. To produce a wall hanging for the farmhouse, Ruth's visiting artist Mark Goodman in his workshop. The materials used by stainers were sourced from their surroundings. So the, the pigments, they, they vary. So you've got cheap ones. Um, for example, that's just a red ochre. That's just a clay. That's actually just dug out of the ground. It's relatively right, cheap. So I can, so can have any sort of brown colour for very little. Yeah, reds, browns, yellows, those sorts of colours. And the more interesting one is lead white. And so obviously lead mined. Mm. Uh, but then to get it into that form there, soaking it in vinegar and then making sure it's coated in vinegar steam for about three to four weeks. And then oh, right, white. you get those little white crystals yeah. on the top. Pigments were mixed with glue made from boiled animal fat, known as size or distemper. Once the paint has been made, it needs to be kept warm to prevent the glue from solidifying. Seems really weird, doesn't it, having to keep your glue, your paint hot? Uh, yes. <laughs> and you, you notice when it's not, because it just doesn't work. It just work. doesn't flow, does it? Yeah, you are just sort of, it. more or less, putting one layer on and staining the canvas. You're not yes. sort of building up layers like an yeah. oil painter would do. So these can be just churned out? These can be uh, created very quickly. 
Scenes from mythology and folklore were popular on wall hangings. Ruth's helping Mark produce a stain of George and the Dragon. It's a bit paint by numbers, this, isn't it? Yeah, it's a cartoon. Yeah, but we're not going to do it. So uh, we're not going to try and make it realistic or put a lot of effort into making it realistic. That takes time, obviously, and hence uh, costs more. So this one's just going to be some nice bright colours. We'll put a little uh, bit of shading in in various places, and that's about it, really. In the 1500s, portraiture was moving away from stylized caricatures. This period saw a transition where more realistic art developed and flourished during the Renaissance. It also brought about advancements in technology. Changes were made to the ancient camera obscura. Tom is sitting for the artist Sigrid Holmwood to experiment with this technique. OK, Tom, so I think you might have to come a little bit closer, if you a can. A little bit closer. Yeah. Oh, no, too close. A bit <laughs> further away. That's it. OK, great. Stay still. OK, so what you need to make a camera obscura is firstly a darkened room. Camera obscura actually means dark room. Um, and then you block out the window um, and you put a hole in it. Daylight bounces off Tom and passes through a lens which flips the image upside down onto the parchment. Early camera obscuras used a pinhole to project the image onto the canvas. But in the Tudor period, lenses were adopted for the first time, making the image brighter and clearer. Even the tiniest movement shows up a lot on this. I'm going to see how this looks soon, but I've got a feeling we might have to try it again. OK, Tom. The thing is, you moved a bit. Um, now. Yeah, you can move now. <laughs> <laughs> Just so checking. You didn't manage to get your nose. It's gone all weird. Yeah, and must be like also, a witch or something. Yeah, exactly. And um, your whole head's a bit compressed um, because you probably moved in one direction after I'd done that. So, I've been trying um, to lose weight, so... <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the way to do it. They need a way of keeping Tom still. And we're sure this is my fault, this one. <laughs> <laughs> You need to. It's, it's just like back. Victorian photography. You need to be as still as possible. Okay, great. That's looking much better now. Okay, keep still. It's like a race against time. Okay, so in this case, um, we've got his nose and his eyes and his mouth really nicely in focus, but actually his ear and the top of his head and his hat are kind of receding and quite fuzzy. You've got this area of focus in the centre, and then you've got this area around the outside which gets out of focus, and this creates distortions in scale. It's quite controversial um, amongst our historians how much the camera obscura was used by artists in the past. There's a lot of resistance to the idea because people think it's cheating. I certainly feel that it was used more than people think. This is a bit like being at the dentist. The moment you're told not to move, everything itches. You can feel insects on your face that probably aren't there. You want to cough, but uh, yeah, it's nice to sit down on the farm rather than be working. Sort of. In the last few weeks, the farm's kitchen garden has burst into life. But unlike modern gardens, the Tudor farmer would have let the weeds thrive as well, because they too had their uses. Now, this little patch here is actually my crop. It may look like a weed patch, but it isn't. This is cleavers and I'm deliberately growing it. I know for many people who spend half their lives trying to take it out of their garden, this may seem madness, but this is my cleaver's crop. And it's useful because, well, you can eat it. Again, it's not delicious, but it, it's all right. But it's also really useful as a, a filter or sieve. If you lay the stems one way and then you lay them the other, you get a really useful filter, which you can use in the dairy, you can use in your brewing, use in your kitchen. Ruth is also letting the weeds flourish amongst her vegetables. Think about this lovely set of beans. If only half of them had germinated and I'd done a really good job of the weeding, I'd end up with some empty dead ground. But I need to eat all year. I need a meal out of this patch every single day of the year. Many of the weeds that have grown are edible, particularly important to the Tudor farmer when the main food crops aren't yet ready to be harvested. The fat hen. This one's not just put upable with. This one's actually quite nice. I quite like fat hen. 
There's also land cresses in amongst all here. Quite a lot of land cresses, actually. And the point is that early on in the process, I allow the weeds a little bit of leeway. And only when I know I've got an established crop will I start taking them out. The land cress and fat hen Ruth's picking will become a Tudor salad. With the outline of the image completed, Sigrid can now paint the portrait. If the camera obscura doesn't actually give you the whole picture, as it were, how come you don't just paint me from scratch? Well, it's a lot easier to correct something that's already down there than start entirely from scratch. Um, but most importantly, um, it's, the, it's the relationship between your eyes, your nose and your mouth and the very subtle little shapes there which really make the difference in getting a likeness. So the camera obscura is almost like a stencil from which you start your work? Yeah, it's a starting point. You really need to still have lots of drawing skills, lots of artistic judgment um, to be able to use it properly. Um, it's not like taking a snapshot. It isn't that easy to use. Painting was viewed as a craft rather than art in Tudor England, but that would change with the influx of artists from Europe. So would artists travel from, like, village to village looking for work or...? In terms of portraiture, there would actually be artists would travel from country to country. So there were a lot of um, artists from the Low Countries that travelled to London and were commissioned to do portraits. So an example is Holbein. Um, so he's a little bit later than our period, more active around the 1530s, but he was from Germany and came to London. And when I look at Holbein's drawings, I think they probably were used, done using a camera obscura. There's little telltale signs. For instance, it's a very large head and then with incredibly small shoulders coming off it. During this period, the Mona Lisa was completed. And artists strove to mirror the soul of the sitter in their work. During this time, you start to get a shift towards a more humanist philosophy, um, where you start to look for God in nature and start to look for God in man. And so, therefore, it becomes much more important um, to try and capture what things look like naturally. It's actually much more people's views changing, and then it makes their art change. Art would decorate the walls of Tudor dining rooms, and fish would dominate the tables. Ruth has brought her eels back to the farmhouse to make the most of this delicacy. So now I've got to get the slime off my eels. Like all freshwater fish, they have a sort of protective slime coating. Salt, rubbing and water. I hate this bit. Mm. I don't know why it is, but the slime on freshwater fish makes me more squeamish, I think, than anything else. Look at that. Ugh. Freshwater fish was hard to come by for people living away from rivers and was only eaten on feast days. It's one of those differences, really, between the monastic community and the lay community. People like us, eels are an occasional treat. In the monasteries, they're almost a staple. For us, fish means salt fish, <laughs> salt cod. It means pickled fish, it means pickled herring. In the monasteries, fresh fish is possible and indeed quite probable on a daily basis. Ruth is cooking the eels as part of a stew known as brewit. She makes a sauce from parsley, breadcrumbs and beer, which gives the dish its name. Getting the texture right is half the battle. The eels are cooked separately and added to the sauce later. Cooked like this, you can see why I've left the skin on. It gives me perfect, organised little gobbets of meat. I love that word. <laughs> it is the period word. The stock from the eels is added for flavour. It does upset me that when you're watching this, You'll be judging it entirely on what it looks like, as opposed to what it tastes and smells like. This isn't posy telly food. This is real food, and it tastes great, and it smells fantastic. Fresh fish may have been a treat for the farmer, but pork was widely eaten at both the top and bottom of Tudor society. Fat was an essential commodity, particularly for monasteries that used it for cooking, candle making, and even shining their shoes. To make money and keep up with demand, the farm must have a continuous supply of pigs. 
A few weeks ago, their boar Turkish was introduced to the sows. Does Turkish here have to fancy the pigs he <laughs> makes with? No, not necessarily. A boar will follow his, his red-blooded uh, primeval instincts. A sow would be introduced to a boar before reaching a year old, and a farmer would regularly check for signs of pregnancy. A positive indicator is when she doesn't show signs of wanting to mate. This is easily tested by the farmer. There's the standing heat test. Right. Do you know anything about no. that? Which is putting all your weight on their, on their back Point hips, quarters, yeah. um, which sort of simulates mounting of the ball, and they will stand, so they will sort of position themselves, get themselves in a position where they're, they're, they're ready to, to be served. So should we give it a go? We can give it a go, yeah. <laughs> Are you, you're comfortable with that? So we, we don't want them to stand if we put our weight here. Yeah, if you put their weight there and they... they... Oh. See, I don't think she is. I mean, she's... Oh, no, sorry. she's not She's not comfortable she's, with She's that, looking so. for her food. Yeah. She's not really interested in what I'm doing. Have a, have a, have a go with Georgie, because I think Georgie's um, looking a bit more of a surefire. Are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that, then, eh? I'm after your women, Turkish. Oh, no, Turkish is a bit confused now. Competition. <laughs> a sow is pregnant for just under four months, and the farmer would want her to give birth before winter to give the piglets a better chance of survival. Timing was critical. Oh, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good boy, and I think, you've, I think you're probably right. I think he's done his job. Yeah. I think he has done his job. Keep an eye on it. After all their exertions, the team has returned to the newly decorated farmhouse. Supper was usually served at 5 p.m. and was normally a simple affair of pottage with vegetables. But tonight, the boys are in for a treat. Here we go, a bit of a treat. Eel. Ooh, fresh water nice. fish. Fresh water fish. I'll get involved. Get some protein, good for the brain. Yeah. Eel. Brain. Eel. <laughs> Something of a luxury. There we go. This yeah. is lovely. Yeah, it's, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's good. I like brew it. It's a nice change. It is a nice change. And it also represents quite a, a luxury dish, really, for lay people. Because to own the fish, you have to own the rights to the ponds and the rivers. And tenants very rarely do. That's all landowners, not tenants like us. Don't you think, you know, everything we've sort of done in the last couple of weeks, it's all been under monastic control, hasn't it? Yeah, and you know, also... I mean, even that inn we stayed in was yeah. owned by the monastery. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought that was one of the best things we've done. I really enjoyed that. And all these stresses of the farm and the pressure from the monastery wasn't quite there, but we were still part of that monastic picture. Well, I can't help notice that, you know, while I've been away, <laughs> you've adorned the place with some beautiful artwork, very effeminate night there. <laughs> Is that you? I think I look noble. Yeah, well, you, you certainly, you got that. You're staring off into the distance. A thousand yards stare. Thinking about farming. <laughs> Next time on Tudor Monastery Farm, the team go to work for the monastery, restoring accommodation. This is going to be. This is going to be a fantastic floor. I can feel it. Washing their linens. It's the bashing that does it. And learning the art of monastic hospitality. I want to stress, I did not drop the custard castle. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>